I'm Sug. I'm Dan. This is the Demystified Zone. Hey, what's up, Dan? Hey. Tell everyone where we are right now. We are at our alma mater. Uh, the University of Illinois, well, a little off campus in Champaign, Illinois. That's right. And you heard right, listeners. Both are alma maters. Yes. Though very different graduating classes. <laughs> Thanks for pointing I'm that out. I'm not going to say, I didn't say <laughs> whose was when, okay? Okay. Yeah. I did that for you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, where are we? Champaign, Illinois. The glamorous and wonderful Champaign, Illinois. The crown jewel of Illinois, some might say. Oh, okay. <laughs> Only me, maybe. <laughs> the crown jewel of East Central Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> the, and it's also paired with Urbana. It always has to be yeah, with Champaign, Urbana. Urbana. Mm-hmm. Just sorry about Ur- you, Urbana. We don't forget you ever. <laughs> I wonder who decided Urbana would come second to Champaign. In the Illinois school system. I don't know. Yeah. No one else cares right now because they're like, where, where is Illinois? Who cares about University <laughs> of Illinois except for us? Okay, well, we got a special episode for y'all today. Yeah. Uh, Dan and I are on location at our alma mater, as he said, in central Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And we're the first time, our spe- first special guest, Dan, yes. Milestone. <laughs> Woo! Yes. Um, today joining us is Mingyung Kim. Uh, what can I say about this wonderful woman? There's too much on here, so I'm going to rattle through a lot here. She is a professor here at the University of Illinois, assistant professor. Okay, good. I hope I didn't mess that up. She has a PhD in communications from Rutgers. She has her BA and MA in communication studies from Colorado State University. Uh, I'm only going to stop there because her list of accolades just goes on and on. She's a very impressive person. She's definitely the smartest person in this room. Definitely. Um, I'm probably, a question. You know what? To, to, because I got you on the age thing, I'm definitely in the bottom rung here when it comes to the intelligence in this room. <laughs> okay, so I'm very intimidated right now. But she's a lovely person. Welcome, Mingyang. Thank you. Good Yay. to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just a little bit more about Mingyang. She uh, has research interests in organizational communication, uh, community resilience, global and intercultural communication, interorganizational networks, digital inequality, ethnic media, intercultural rhetoric, and she's an expert at K dramas. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I added that last part, but I think it's true. <laughs> she didn't write that in, but I added that in there. Um, she is a uh, descendant of professors. She, not only is she super smart, her predecessors are also super smart. And yeah. uh, something interesting about Mingyang is that her father was a professor, retired now, right, in Korea of Western philosophy mm-hmm. and environmental studies. And also her grandfather was a professor. So what did he uh, teach on and what was his like, expertise? I didn't really see that. Philosophy and living a happy life. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that's a really, that's a hard undertaking to be a <laughs> professor in those two things. Um, something really unique, and she's going to talk way, there, we don't have enough time for this special yeah. guest, so I'm going to get into it, but I want to drop in this factoid. Ming Young's grandfather, or Harabaji for our speaker, yes. <laughs> speaking, did I say that okay? Ming Young, did I say that okay? Okay. Um, was, uh, how do I say this right? Village buds with the God man himself, Kim Il sung. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So her grandfather were, was growing up in the same village of, as Kim Il sung. Um, and we're going to put this in the notes for the listeners. There's a BBC interview that y'all need to all check out again. That's how packed this episode is going to be. We don't have time to show this awesome interview of her grandfather talking about, how he knew Kim Il Sung as like the dude down the street, dude down the street, the dude down the street that came to recruit him for the Great Revolution. Yeah. Am I am I saying everything correct so far, Mingyang? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, you got it. So she is a direct descendant of uh, what was your grandfather's name? Kyung Suk Kim. Kyung Suk Kim. Look him up, y'all. Uh, Google this BBC interview. We'll also put in the notes. Um, again, yeah. comes from this great line of of. Korean uh, academia here. Yeah. And we're, let's welcome her again, Dan. Paksu. 
that means I don't know what that means. I just know to say it. <laughs> Applause. Applause. Yeah. Yes. Welcome, Mingyang. How are you doing? Good. Good. How are you? Good. We're doing great. So, Mingyang, just give us a little bit about yourself. Tell our listeners a little about you. Um, I know you're a teacher here down in the University of Illinois. Mm-hmm. Um, give us like a just you know, t- tell us what you're about. Like, where did you come from? What was your upbringing like? And uh, give the listeners just an idea of who you are. Sure. I mean, I could go on and on and on mm. about myself. Um, so, <laughs> Me too. As introduced, my name is Mingyang Kim. I'm a faculty here at U of I. Um, I was, I consider myself a global citizen. So although I am a Korean, I was born in Germany and then I was educated. I grew up in South Korea and then I was educated here in the United States. So I've been all around different places and sort of that in-between world of so many different culture and history yeah. and livelihood and whatnot. And here I am in the Midwest as my final destination. I'm hoping. <laughs> final destination. <laughs> wow. I'm hoping. That's a big oh, commitment. Wow. Let me so I caution say now, you against but, that. Yeah. <laughs> as someone who went here uh, in undergrad, though, you know, many years ago, Maybe you shouldn't commit yet. <laughs> the final destination. I'm no, just saying that. I hear you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a great just place. Wait, just wait until deep into February. Weather, <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, I survived that polar vortex oh, that did? Okay, stormed that's true, through that's Illinois true. in the last three weeks. That's and true. I loved it. Oh, wow. Summer is what I have issues with. Really? So we'll okay. see how many summers I can survive without. Okay. <laughs> mm, you're like my daughter. My daughter is like totally like a winter person. Yeah. But there is a certain aromatic here in the cornfields of <laughs> uh, Champaign-Urbana. Yeah. If those of you who've been here know, uh, it's not a pleasant one. I'll say yeah, that. Yeah, it's... it's you could smell it, yeah, for sure. Interesting. Oh, you haven't smelled it? Uh uh-uh, uh. No. Whoa. Wait, whoa. Are you talking about the cornfields when no, they're all I'm talking shaved about like off? The cow fields, the cow, really. Oh, the, the, but the, you know, you're talking to somebody who lived in Colorado. Uh, okay. My yeah, town yeah. was near this town called Greeley, mm. which has probably one of the largest um, cow butcher system okay. oh, in the United States. So when the wind blows, I hear, I, I smell everything. Okay. <laughs> everything from the farm. Greeley, so. Colorado listeners, we don't mean that as a slight against yeah. you. It's just a different uh, industry, yeah. different farming. Champagne land. is a definite slight. Like, I, I, I'm slighting you, Champagne. <laughs> it did not, I would, did not enjoy that as my time here. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. But, uh, okay, so Ming Yang, you have a ton of expertises here. And obviously, yeah. we have so much to learn from you. We're two idiots talking about North Korea. <laughs> I, w- I could say one. Dan is actually an expert on North Koreans, his own right. Um, and there's so much we want to learn. We have so many questions. Sure. Because that's what we do here. We just talk about, you know, with North Korea, that's the big thing. We don't know. We don't know what we don't know sometimes. We know yeah. certain things, but we don't know what we don't know. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have a very unique background mm-hmm. in that uh, your grandfather was there right when the revolution started Mm -hmm. and the separation was beginning. In fact, he was homeboys with the guy who started it, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Tell us about that story. Uh, Tell everyone about this. What what happened there? And and give us a little brief, like, what was your grandfather doing? How did he know Kim Il-sung, all that? Sure. I mean, I wouldn't call myself an expert in North Korea. Um, I mainly am interested in organizations that are helping North Korean people become more sustainable Mm. once they escape and leave their homeland for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, so my upbringing was really unique, as you said. Um, so my grandfather is a, from North Korea. He was born and raised in North Korea. He was born in 1920. Um, so when the war broke out in 1950, he was already you know, working as a school teacher. He had children. He had mm. his whole livelihood developed and est- established there. Um, my father was born in 1946, and before the war broke out, as the BBC interview... In, in 1950, right? Uh, when the war broke out in 1950... Thank you, Dan. Dan, Dan right. is our resident historical <laughs> fact checker. And I appreciate just that. To, cause just to drop that in. I get carried yeah. away with no com- <laughs> No computer in front of me, their listeners. He's just a wealth of knowledge. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, or, no worries. Um, so I actually didn't hear much about this until way later in my life when I kind of... <laughs> Yeah. Like pieces of the puzzles came together at yes. some point. And I grew up in the generation. So I went to school in South Korea in the 90s, elementary and middle school. 
that taught a lot about North and South Korea relationship, the dynamics of the political, um, cultural, and historical tension, as well as what's expected of us as South Koreans and the next generation that's up and coming to do to kind of mitigate that issue. Mm -hmm. So these were some of the implicit messages that okay, I would I say. Wanna, I want to interrupt because yeah. already you're giving us so many. I've got so many <laughs> questions. <already. laughs> that's crazy. What did they tell you? So, yeah. uh, again, listeners, just for a frame of context here, uh, Ming Yang grew up in South Korea post war, um, and they're teaching you, the South Korean government is teaching you something about North Korea. Mm -hmm. What is the framework they're telling you? What are they telling you? Sure. So, I mean, on top of my head, one of the first experiences was we were taught to dial 113 if we spot a spy from North Korea. <laughs> wow. And That's the spy one, line. 113. Did you yeah. guys have a 911? What was your 911? 119. 119. 119. Or 112 is the police. <laughs> oh. And 113 literally is an assigned number to For report spy. <laughs> and I remember seeing this little paper that had like 10 different list, of, like list of 10 items that says yeah. how to spot a North Korean spy. Oh. Number one, if you see an old man who's running, that's a spy. What? what? If you see a person who's kind of disguised with white beard and white hair, but at the back you see black hair, that's a wig, that's a spy. Oh, so these wow. are the things that we were given from the school. Dan, it's a good thing you weren't around back then because <laughs> you already hair. hit one and two right there, jogging yeah. or exercising, old man, and, <laughs> and your hair. They would have, someone would have called you in, that 113 right away. I know, yeah. You're lucky. Yeah, yeah. and that's when I was in, say, third grade, 93, wow. year 1993. Okay. Wow. I mean, I never had to call the number, but then again, Did you I ever just do it for fun, though? You know how like, kids like punk 911 I and just call? I never. No? What about your friend? Call. None of your friends ever called it? Maybe they did. We, uh, we didn't talk about it. Um, I took the law very seriously. So I focused more on if that's a mission, I need to look on the street to make sure if I'm really spotting a spy. Um, so anybody who's sort of, you know, weird or strange on the street, my first antenna would be, that might be a spy. I need to pay attention. That was me in third yeah, grade. So my cousins, um, they would tell me, my cousins who grew up there, told me that certain words that they used, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, like, uh, no problem in North Korea is il anya, mm. right? It up so. It up so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That means, that Wait, which is the mean, North Korean one? <laughs> that's, that's the North Korean one. Il up so? It up so. Okay. Like, it's no work, right? Basically, yeah. it's ah. no, no problem. Yeah. But in South Korean, it's... Yeah, there's that. different phonetics. Um, just basically very different language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good job, Dan. That was really good. Oh, That's like I the best Korean so you put hard. out in this podcast so far. <laughs> yeah, so they they were taught mm -hmm. look for certain phrases as right. well. Were there any other like phrases that you had to look out for? Oh, um, we learned those phrases yeah, at like school. What? Like they would teach us, this is what these things are called in North Korea versus mm. South Korea. And these were like mm. legit Korean classes. Um, so for example, like the word ice cream would be called orum in oh. North Korea. And we learned those. Huh. Interesting. Wait, okay. So in America, when we were growing up, I think the closest thing was like stranger danger, right? Like <laughs> don't let this pedophile kidnap you and take you. Yeah. So watch out for strangers. strangers and then we'd have yeah. like certain signs. Is that what it was like for you growing up? Like, watch out for the North Korean strangers. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And you were scared as a child, like, oh my God, that old man is running right now. Mm -hmm. Is that what you think? If you saw an old man running, like Hadabaji running, you'd be like, oh my right. gosh, why is that Hadabaji running right now? Right. I mean, I can't attest to everyone else, but that was me. Yeah. And I mean, and I'm the type of person who listens to instructions and i follow the instructions <laughs> religiously without even you, assessing you are a professor <laughs> yeah yes. you're a, you're a good person basically <laughs> you can, we can't relate over here <laughs> i would have definitely dialed on one three but all of that changed though because that was like 92 93 mm. and then 94 is when kim il sung died okay. and i was at a local bakery at that time across the street from my school mm. and there was a news coming out Headline breaking news saying Kim Il-sung died. Yeah. We all chanted Manse. 
And these wow. are fourth graders chanting manse in tell the us, middle of bakery. Tell us what that means. Yeah, for those manse. So manse is like, hooray. Yeah. The dictator's wow. dead. Like, wow. But for a fourth graders to do that, now that I think about it, that's bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> were the teachers in on it too? They were like goading the No, cheering? it was just all of us. Just Because it was, wow. I distinctly remember it was Saturday. And we, go to, we went to school on Saturdays until yeah. 95. So 95 is when they switched to Monday to Friday schedule and Saturday, Sunday would be completely off. Until year 94, we went to school on Saturdays. and Monday we would be, through Saturday? Yeah, and then Saturday would be half day and uh. we would be in school until like noon. So afternoon, that's like lunchtime. So we would usually gather up at the bakery and just do whatever, right? Because yeah, yeah, we all yeah. lived in the same village and it was just yeah. like walking distance. Mm-hmm. And that particular Saturday was like a big festival yes. because Kim Il-sung died. There's nothing funny about it, but as South Koreans who are educated um, under a particular sort of administration at that time, but also coming from that history, um, given where things were at that time, fourth graders thought, Yes, yeah. this is a hooray moment. But it, it does make sense, though. You know, like that was the, I don't want to say propaganda, but that was the worldview you were given, right? Absolutely. Like it, it is, I mean, I, I don't know what the, the only thing that comes to my mind in terms of the American comparison is when JFK died. Like everyone sure. was watching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? It's, that, it's that moment, I'm guessing. Everyone was watching. Everyone was it's listening. It's historical. It's yeah. a huge historical moment. And every North Korean remembers where they were at when mm-hmm. they heard. Absolutely. Yeah. And because of the types of education I received to a young mind, fourth grader, mm-hmm. Kim Il-sung's death equaled end of war. We are mm-hmm. going to be one country again yeah. without really knowing the economic and the national and international discrepancies that may you know, yeah. come as a consequence. Right? Fourth graders don't think much. It's like you mm-hmm. take the information in, you just acquire it you don't assess or evaluate yeah so that was my fourth grade mind <laughs> let's talk about that more so uh in your mind you were thinking or you were taught to think even maybe mm-hmm. that now there's going to be reunification mm-hmm. what did that one obviously reunification didn't happen because we're still north and south today mm-hmm. but in your mind what did that look like to you? Like, what, what did you think was going to happen sure. after, the, after, you know, Kim Il-sung had mm-hmm. been passed away? So one of the biggest resonance of unification was we learned about all these natural resources available in North Korea. Yeah. So I remember in our sociology class, we drew a map of South and North Korea and kind of pinpointed which area is popular for what. So, you know, somewhere in South Korea, there's a region popular for rice. Um, in North Korea, there are mines and coals and yeah. mm. uh, maybe corns are a thing or because mm. it's so cold and there are certain crops that grow better in North Korea versus yeah. South Korea. Yeah. So we were like learning. buckwheat. Yeah, like buckwheat's one of them. I knew you were going to bring yeah, that up. absolutely. <laughs> You're always going to your Ningmen, yeah. Dan. <laughs> and those kinds of sort of resource exchange was one yeah. of the rationale behind unification based on the textbook. Yes. Again, yeah. I was not a very studious person, but I remembered these things. I don't things believe that because for a second. <laughs> For some reason, I was very interested in this dynamics of North and South Korea, the war, the division. and Mm. The fact that you were interested in that tells me that's (laughs) not true. That's not true. I was not interested in any politics at that age, but continue. I'm sorry. No. So that was one of the big things. Oh, if we're united, we're going to be a one big strong country again. Mm. Yes. Because our history lesson taught us that we were colonized by Japan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that equals we're a weak country. We were eaten by another country. Okay. But if we were to be a one united strong country with resources and means to kind of carry our own um, yeah. you know, governance and really establish that, mm-hmm. maybe something like the Japanese colonization will not happen. Yes. So those are the things that came to my mind. And that's why the idea of war and being under ceasefire was so daunting to me. And I remember going to bed every night praying, please don't let the North Korean people invade us again. Because we learned that June 25th, at the crack of dawn, when everybody was home, no soldiers and the milita- no soldiers guarding the military station, that's when the invasion started. Mm. So to my young mind, that could happen any day. Really? Huh. Huh. That's wow. quite that's quite a I'm kind of depressing everybody, but <laughs> No, it's not you know what? 
you, we love to be depressed. That's where we show. live. Yeah. yeah, that's that's why we talk about <laughs> North Korea. There's something wrong with us. But uh, yeah. that's such a really unique perspective to have as a child. Well, that's the thing, I guess. You know, that's something you don't think about. Like in America, we have our moments mm-hmm. in history. Nine Eleven for us, more in modern, right? Like, no, but but yeah, growing up in the eighties, <laughs> yes. We were afraid of nuclear yes, war from yes. Russia. Mm-hmm. We Cuban had, Missile Crisis. We had um, nuclear war drills, right? Because that was a very clear and present danger before the fall of the USSR. So, mm-hmm. it was, but the threat was far away still for us. Yes, yes. It wasn't just over like 50 miles away, basically. Well, it's also, I think what's interesting about her dynamic is like there was hope with the threat mm. right like she had this hope that oh we're gonna be unified now yeah but then also it's like well maybe not though maybe things <laughs> will go the wrong way and they're gonna invade us again yeah i have a question about that yeah like um so you were taught to look out for north koreans their accent their mm-hmm. their fake wigs their fake white wigs <laughs> and the way they run but also you were taught unification was a mm-hmm. good thing yeah how did you like kind of consolidate those two things in your mind, in your very young mind at the time. Yeah, I mean, at that time, I don't think I really had a clear understanding of why we had to look for spies, Yeah. right? Like, shouldn't it be, in a young mind, like, shouldn't it be the police's job, right? But Mm. then again, the notion of spy also can be in your everyday life. Yes. And there had been so many movies that was created, like Shitty mm-hmm. is one of them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also in 96, 13 spies were spotted and captured, killed and captured in the East Sea. That was like one of the biggest um, sort of discovery of the fact that North Koreans still send spies. Yes. Um, at least for me, based on the news and the media. Uh-huh. Um, but it's, it's really... Wait, what year was that? 96. 96. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So 96, um, a taxi driver spotted this weird submarine floating around the East Sea, reported that. That ended up being the submarine that carried 13 something, 20 something spies down. And some of them were captured in the mountain or were killed or something. Um, I, 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 I don't remember the full story, but that was like a big scandal. But now this is like, and I remember things based on years because I kind of link it to what grade I was in and what I experienced that year. But even like in third grade, we learned a song called Our Hope is Unification. And we were taught to memorize it and we sang it in our music class. And can you can you sing it now? <laughs> yeah, I think it, it went something like Our Hope is Unification. No, no, no. Can you like sing it? Sing oh, it? like sing it, yeah. sing it. <laughs> okay. You don't have to. If you're not no, I remember I make it though. Sing. Okay, yes, please. Yeah, yeah so it's like, um, something, something, something. Like, that means Tongyeol. unification. Oh. Yeah. So it's kind of embedding that idea of, yes. Hopefully, unification is down the road, and that's what your generation, like aka our generation, will be responsible for. Mm. Although, like, who knows, right? Like, it's not like something was so immediate. Mm. And then the fall of North Korea really began, like, much later on, 97, 8, when there was a big flood, a big famine, and hunger, leadership change, right? Uh, so, the North Korea that our preceding generations knew that was probably richer than South Korea at some point in the history um, was slowly gearing towards a decline from the death of Kim Il-sung and then thereafter. And um, in my middle school education, I don't remember much about this, but there was always something about North Korea that was being taught in school. And June 25th is a national holiday that's when the Korean War broke out. So June 25th, all day long, you watch documentary after another that's being broadcasted on a national scale. And it's just the norm to us. Hmm. So when it's June, I'm like, oh, June 25th is coming. So what's going to be up then? Then, like, So it's kind of like, it's it's my life. Like, it's probably every South Korean's life from that generation. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have a great voice. It's nice to know that Dan also has a partner now in musicality. We like to yeah. explore yeah. musical talents here. We'll harmonize together that same Yeah, we'll have to do that time. again yeah. later and cut it into the, the <laughs> post. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got really distracted <laughs> by the lovely song. Um, so, I mean, one that's... Uh, it, it's amazing that that's 
the context you grew up in. And to me, it's still like a dichotomy mm. of like when you share this, even uh, pre-interview, when you were sharing uh, with us beforehand, I was like, well, does that mean were, were you taught to think North Korea is good or bad? It sounds like both, you know, yeah, kind of and it's yeah. and again, it, it shouldn't be so binary. But at the same time, there was a message given to you, obviously, and it was very specific how they framed that message to you as well. Now I'm going to go into more uh, your opinion as an adult, knowing what you know now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, listeners, I mean, Gung, uh, she's a world traveler. She's you were born in Germany, right? Is that correct? She's been all over the place. Again, way more intellectual and well more versed than Dan over here. Yes. Uh, and myself. I should just include myself. <laughs> right. right. Thank you for that. I just assume they think you're above me all the time. So if I say <laughs> you, they'll all know already. You know, that's yeah. no knock to you, my, you, my friend. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, Minga, what, what is your take now? What is, I, I guess, twofold. What does reunification mean to you? What would that look like now? And how do you interpret that? Is it like, in term, I guess the simplest is, is it good or bad to you? Mm-hmm. Do you think it should happen, not happen, or how should it look? Right. I mean, unification, I think, is such a complex issue. And honestly, I'm not sure what I consider unification is or what my vision of unification looks like. Uh, But one of the things that I'm kind of trying to grapple with is unification for what and unification for whom remain unanswered to me. So if you think about unification in terms of just uniting these two countries that share the same history, similar culture, same language, does that mean one becomes subsumed into the other in terms Mm. of governance, Mm. economy, like resource sharing? Or is it more like keeping two separate political agenda, but we sort of have become an open system? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, And that's something I also need more information to really make an assessment of what's the short term and the long term goal and the outcome that we're all envisioning in ways that benefit both. Hmm. Um, But I'm not supporting the North Korean government at all. Mm -hmm. Um, However... I have empathy for the people Mm. in North Korea who are suffering from famine, hunger, um, uncertainty, and um, sort of that breach of freedom, that restriction. So if unification means that they can be liberated and become part of the world society, not just networking with South Korea, perhaps that's what unification should be. Um, But also you have to be realistic about the governance too. Like how is the economy going to look like? It's, it's not going to be the same as the Berlin war came down when the Berlin war came down in North, like East and West Germany unification. Mm-hmm. Although that's what a lot of Koreans are kind of envisioning that's going to happen. Um, so, yeah. So I'm sorry. Question. Were you around when the Berlin wall came down? I was five years old when the Berlin wall came down. So I never in Germany, in but, Germany. So wow. I was born in 1984 <sighs> So at that time, it was still East versus West Germany. Yeah. So someone like my dad, who's lived in Germany for 13 years, he's never set a foot in East Germany yeah. ever. Hmm. So th- <laughs> that's even more me. I didn't realize that. When, yeah. That's a great I, question. Because yeah. now you. you've seen two countries <laughs> that have like very similar divide, literal physical divides in the country. And you, were, I mean, you were five years old, but still you were there when the Berlin Wall came down. Um, what are the similar... Like, what do you see, do, or let me ask it this way. Are there any things that you feel like we could take from the Germany um, conflict of the division and apply it to the Korean one, or do you think it's just two separate things completely? And then also, what are the differences? Sure. Yeah. I wish I had, an, I had an answer. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. I have an even harder question now to follow. <laughs> <laughs> it's more fun, though. Okay, let's say... Um, you are, we live in hypotheticals. This is where, because we have no intelligence here, so we just make up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, hypothetically, you were born, Mingyang Kim, born as you are now, under a double, triple, nay, triple rainbow on the DMZ. Both South and North Korea will bend to your will. What would you, in just your personal understanding of both Koreas, how would you reunify the two? What do you see it being? Obviously, this is super hypothetical. Sure. Do not hold this against her. She's just 
we're just imagining here. What would you, what do you see as like a unified Korean for your Korea for yourself? Hmm. I mean, it's definitely going to be multi phase. Mm. Um, personally, if I could have open access to visit North Korea, even just to travel, not even to live or work or whatnot, but just to have access to the land. That would be, to me, a step one of unification. Um, everything else will require so much time to sort out and because it's a completely different system. Mm -hmm. um, and if I go there, I'm going to be experiencing a culture shock mm -hmm. and vice versa. But right now, the desire is that like, I could go to the northest part of South Korea and look at North Korea from a river away. That really kills me. Mm. I'm like, that's where my family's from, yet I cannot set a foot inside of that land. So, I mean, unification itself is such a big idea, so I don't even want to tackle all the consequences of economic and, you know, political and whatnot. But as a South Korean, if I just could just have a physical access to the location, the geography of North Korea, I mean, that would be pretty wonderful. Okay, now I'm going to push you in further and make you make us. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we treat our guests. That's why they had no guests ever come on here. <laughs> Would you personally want to see North and South Korea become like Germany, where it's one Germany again? Mm. Um, all of a sudden. All of a sudden, right? Yeah. I understand it's going to take time. But we'll say the sure. time happens. Yeah. Sure. And, and we go through all the right channels and things work out perfectly. Do you think that, for you personally, again, this is a personal opinion, listener. Don't send us emails, please. Um, <laughs> as one Korea, or do you think they should be two separate ones in the end? That's a good question. I mean, I can see the benefits of both. Mm. Being two separate, but having an open access. But you as supreme leader, born under a triple rainbow, what would you choose? <laughs> hmm. Assuming all the right steps were taken... All the considerations were made mm -hmm. in ways that we found a way to benefit both countries to become one and to not have to deal with severe negative consequences. <laughs> Being a one united country would be wonderful. Mm. But then again, my question remains, what's going to be the governance? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that's a very, it, it, it's a, a real world problem. Well, it'll be a theocracy because you'd be the God that was born <laughs> under the triple rainbow. You would be our new eternal president. Yeah. And what about you, Dan? What's your answer to that one? Yeah. It's triple rainbow, Dan Chung is born. Uh, All hail Dan Chung. I was, I was born under a triple rainbow. Oh, really? Um, in Seoul. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, that's the thank you for asking. I've been dying to answer. <laughs> no, um, he just wanted to get that fact out there. It's been 22 yeah, episodes. Yeah. He hasn't been able to say that yet. <laughs> so, yeah, I, of course, I would love to see one Korea. Romantically speaking, right? It sounds so wonderful. Yeah. But, okay. In the U.S., where I live and grew up, and I'm a citizen of, there are so many problems from the emotions of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, America's legacy of X, Y, and Z, oh boy, still to this day haunt us, right? And the disparities created from our mistakes in the past linger on to this day and haunt us and cause so many problems. I wonder and yeah, I wonder how Korea would be able to bridge those issues. Mm -hmm. Cause I think like you said, Min Young, if we technically did everything correct and we're somehow hopefully under one democracy, right? Let's, I, I'm pulling for the d democratic <laughs> side, but, um, it, and we're all under one democracy. How do we emotionally join together? That's a different story mm -hmm. and a different dynamic. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if you guys knew, but South Korean people are, and I'm sure North Korean people are very, 
xenophobic <laughs> at times. <laughs> Can be. Not all of. I'm not. I'm not general. But I've seen a lot of xenophobia because South Korea has been invaded over our history, right? We have been invaded over and over, and this has given us this. I I, I don't even want to say xenophobia. It's this this side where we're very suspicious of outsiders, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And North Koreans are coming in right now and they're feeling that suspicion. How can we, how can we bridge that divide? It's a very significant divide. Mm-hmm. So yeah, my, que- my question is just from a, an emotional standpoint, how would we ever bridge that gap? I, that, that to me is even more complicated than the political. Yeah. Samsung. That's how we bridge the gap. <laughs> Technology, Technology and wonders. The wonders of entertainment <laughs> and K-pop. That's how <laughs> we, we, just, we just create a better version of K-pop. Yeah. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you feel? How do you feel about... <laughs> Honestly, my feelings don't yeah. matter because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I live in a world of butterflies and rainbows. So uh, I would love for to see one Korea only... And I come from the farthest connection of this i'm i'm way more american than i am korean but culturally culturally yes Mm -hmm. um and i'm generally an optimist so yes there are darknesses and things terrible uh things in our history but i feel like the future is bright and beautiful and yes if we can get to a united korea under a single government hopefully it is not the current north korean government (laughs) um that Yes, there will be things that that need to be worked through, but I feel like the positives will outweigh the negatives Mm. going forward of like just thriving. I mean, here's my thing, and this is going to sound super capitalistic from, (laughs) well, whatever. (laughs) Listeners, you've already made your decision if you're listening this far. Um, The South Korean government, or just the country, in the last 50 years, I've read some report, like, the GDP growth alone and the change in the economy. If you go to Korea in 1980 and you go to Korea in 2000, you have two different Koreas completely. And then even more so if you go from the 2000 to 2020 now, again, two different South Koreas completely. Like this society has grown and advanced so fast, um, unlike any other nation in the world, actually. And I'm not just saying it because I'm Korean. I'm super proud. <laughs> but it's true. Mm-hmm. I can only imagine what that would look like if North Korea joined them in that prosperity, right? And I think that's beautiful. To me, that's like the utopian beauty of it, of like, yes, if we can get through all the difficult uh, emotional and hatred of the, 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 the war that's still not ended, um, I think the upside of that is, is beautiful. And you would have, and not just for the sake of having a powerful nation in terms of like GDP or economy, but just a flourishing one mm-hmm. that... And, and here's my other take is like, because I come from entertainment and film now is like, I feel like only now recently has the world begin to see the beauty of Korean culture yes. in film and media, K-pop, whatever you want to call it. I don't even like K-pop, K-pop that much. <laughs> don't, don't hate me for that listeners. <laughs> um, but it's brought so much joy and like Dan and I talk about this all the time. We think the cultural bridge is the bridge mm-hmm. to North yeah. Korea right? Like sharing, we have such a deep passion for art and entertainment. Uh, and to me, that's how I answer the question. Mm. I see the bright side. I think together combined forces, we're going to dominate. We're going to be the new Hollywood. It's going to be <laughs> out there in Pyong Seoul. That's what we're going to call that new city in between on the DMZ <laughs> or combine the two. But that's how I would answer that. But thank you for including yeah. me into that. No, I yeah, no. <laughs> I, that just shows how pessimistic I am. <laughs> I, when I see a situation, I see the problem uh, first and not the No, upside. you're empathetic, Dan. That's <laughs> I, why you're I, so I'm beautiful. Also, you're an yeah. empathetic person. <laughs> that is why. I'm also empathetic, but yeah, it's, yeah. No, all right, thank all you right. for that. No, I, I, that, that is a great answer. You know, like that's, that's the heaven of Korea if Korea reaches heaven or paradise, whatever <laughs> we look, you know. I don't know if that lore is in Kim Il-sung's <laughs> legend. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, okay, uh, Ming Gyeong, we're going to do, we like to speculate a lot on this podcast <laughs> and we feel like your speculation will be a little more accurate than ours because you're closer to the heart of issues and you understand the culture better than us. Um, I'm not sure about that, but okay, <laughs> go on. I can affirm already, yes, you do. 
Um, the all right, we're gonna do a pro and con for unification, not unification. Pros and cons. Okay, we're gonna just list it out here because you know this is like to me this is like one of our key political issues here in the U.S. and so I wouldn't rile our listeners up. The one that I could think of is like legalization of marijuana, right? Like we have like a very big divide on this issue yeah. amongst our other more serious issues in this country. Um, but to f- listeners, like in Korea, this is one of those hot button topics, reunification, right? You've very got a very so. strong pro and a very strong mm-hmm. con or for maybe more of our context, a right and a left, right? All right, and I'm going to have you play both sides because you are the expert. All right, and then Dan will be your opposite of whatever you do. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, we'll start with the pro side. Just give us a pro. What's a pro of unification? Mm-hmm. You can be as generic as you want. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I can think of is potential economic growth based on natural resource sharing that's unique to each land mm. that becomes a fortified unit to really advance what Korea can offer. Dan Khan. <laughs> um, <laughs> to that point of uh, resources, shared resource, resources. Shared resources. How will those resources be div- uh, distributed? Mm-hmm. There's already a income, a huge income disparity in yeah. South Korea, much mm-hmm. greater than the U.S. How would that, how would that be distributed? Okay. Would it all just go to the rich people? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Chebos. All right, yeah. Mingyun, con to reunification. Hmm. The complexity of the two different governance system and mm. what, how will that be sorted out? There's a lot of uncertainty. Okay, and pro, we- Dan. Love can conquer <laughs> all. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we will like say, all right, sure. <laughs> pro, Mingyun. We will no longer be under ceasefire. Hey. That's a removed threat. What's your con to that, Dan? I got one. <laughs> North Korea can no longer test missiles for fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big con. They lose Kim, a lot. Kim Jong-un's daughter will have no place to <laughs> go l- watch a... Celebrate her 18th birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, con, Mingyun. Con, cultural social gap. Ah, that's a big one. What's the pro to that, Dan? How do we fix that? The pro to that is, well, maybe in the melding of the two cultures, there can emerge one stronger culture. Mm. My pro is we have a real-life squid game happening <laughs> between <laughs> oh and South Korea. Oh, my goodness. Wow. But, you know, but you know, safe. <laughs> a safe squid game. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any more pro? <laughs> I've already killed this game. Uh, I've squid game the own my own game, which is unusual. <laughs> the pro, uh, I have another pro. Yeah, pro. Um, or free fire. If you guys got pros or cons, okay. let's just shoot them out yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have another pro. It's uh, the um, the travel between the two that the families can mm-hmm. finally be reunited. Oh, that's mm-hmm. a good one. Yeah. No more of those year long or yearly uh, propagandist. Reunification ceremonies, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. They can all be pro from here now. We don't need to do these <laughs> cons. What else you got, Ming Young? Hmm. I mean, yeah, I was also gonna say the family unification, or even for the descendants of mm. somebody who lived in North Korea to kind of retrace their family history and to be able to kind of learn more about their roots, because mm. learning about their roots in Korean culture is that's a big deal. Yeah. 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 Because there's so much of it was lost, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. All right, here's a huge pro. Mm. We have invented a new game of basketball <laughs> where we play by the North Korean rules developed by Kim Jong-un. Yeah. And, and invite Dennis Rodman. Oh, no, 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 that's a con. That's a con <laughs> to my point. That is the con to my point. The pro is that we adopt the new game. Yes. Dennis Rodman should not be the commissioner of the new game at all. He could play. He can play, though. Yeah. Uh, another Another pro is... The greatest threat to security in the region will be removed, and mm. prosperity. I can only see prosperity from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. That's a nice one. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I, I kind of already said that one. Before. Oh, you did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Early on, but that's okay. 
<laughs> well, I think there's a lot of pros and cons. Uh, but yes. more pros. I think we're, it sounds like, Minga, if I can speak for you a little bit, there's a lot of hurdles. Mm-hmm. It's a long, it's a big mountain. But what, mm-hmm. what good deed is not filled with a lot of hard things to mm-hmm. get to it? Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to our chat with Professor Min Kyung Kim. Man, I thought it was so interesting. And uh, yeah, we'll be back in a couple weeks with our second part of the interview with her. So stay tuned.